welcome uh, to Trithia Matra. Uh, we have uh, two very special guests uh, with us. And uh, to my left, uh, Professor and Endowed Chair in Urban Entomology in Texas A&M University, Dr. Edward Vargo. And to my right, Dr. Munjir Ahmed Chaudhary, Chairman of Bangladesh River Conservation Commission and Chairman of the Center for Governance Studies. Uh, uh, Dr. Vargo and Dr. Chaudhary, welcome to the show. Uh, Dr. Edward Vargo, you have uh, been staying in Bangladesh uh, for a week now, and uh, so what is your experience regarding uh, Bangladesh? Uh, is this your first time in Bangladesh? This is my first time in Bangladesh, yes. But I've been having a great time. Um, I've been, it's a beautiful country. I've been able to get out of the city and go to Kushtia and some surrounding areas. And uh, it's very lush and green. Um, and I've been learning about the culture, so we got to visit uh, Robin Drinath um, Tagore's house, um, so and got to hear some songs. So learning about the culture and the food has been really good. <laughs> it's been excellent, um, and it's been a pleasure. I've, I've been traveling with Chairman uh, Dr. Chowdhury, and learning about the the river system too, and learning how some of the politics works and how he has to work with some of the local officials mm -hmm. as a national official um, and hear some of the dialogue uh, that takes place. It's very encouraging. So obviously um, Bangladesh is a, a country with many people and in the U.S. we don't know that much about Bangladesh. We don't hear that much about it. We don't learn that much about it. Um, so it's been a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, there are lots of people here, but you can see the development taking place at a very rapid rate. Um, all the, the brick factories and all the building and construction going on, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but I've, I've been impressed with the dedication of the, the officials at the national and local levels mm -hmm. and the high level of discussion that takes place. Uh, the breadth of knowledge they have is really, truly remarkable. So um, I hope that I'm here as, as an ecologist w working with Dr. Chowdhury on looking at river conservation with the mm -hmm. National River Conservation Commission. And um, I'm hoping that with all of the de development taking place, um, that some policies can be put into to, to place to ensure that that growth happens responsibly and sustainably so that to protect the environment. Um, so I think it's important that we protect the environment because all of our futures mm -hmm. depend and you also, on the And you also visited uh, Bangabundu Museum too. Yes. Um, so that was, that was really good uh, to learn about the, the history of Bangladesh and the, the making of the country. I mean, in the U.S. we hear about, you know, the ind independence of the Indian subcontinent. We know about the Liberation War, but we don't know a lot of the details. Mm -hmm. So to actually see the house um, and where the family lived and where he lived was, um, was a special experience. And uh, you are a professor in urban and structural entomology. Uh, you have studied entomology for many years uh, and published so many papers too. Uh, what motivated you to choose this uh, field of study? Um, that's a good question. Uh, as an undergraduate, uh, I was a biology major, mm -hmm. and I got very interested in social insects. So things like ants and honeybees and wasps and termites that live in colonies, where individuals work together to form what we call a super organism. So you have a bunch of individuals working together to form something bigger than themselves. And I was always fascinated by how this process, how this works, and how these societies function. Um, and so when I was looking for graduate programs, I knew of Dr. Murray Blum, who is a very uh, well-known entomologist at the University of Georgia, uh, studying ants. And so I applied to work with him. And I went there, and that's where I met uh, Dr. Chowdhury, who was also a graduate student mm -hmm. at the University of Georgia. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Manjira Chowdhury, it's, it's been uh, nine months since uh, you have joined as a chairman. Uh, of Bangladesh River Conservation Commission. Um, uh, so far, uh, what is your experience as a uh, responsible person um, of the organization? The first thing is that uh, the 
job of protecting about 20% of Bangladesh, that's uh, uh, water, water areas, uh, river area, uh, which is a huge area. And the problem is uh, tremendous. That you have to protect these rivers and water bodies from encroachment. You have to protect these rivers, water bodies, estuaries, and other water bodies from uh, pollution, and also maintain uh, the navigability of these uh, rivers and water bodies. And so it is a, a very challenging job. And uh, we, our manpower is limited, but our determination is very high. So we are forging ahead. We have already uh, done some uh, works. We have put some uh, sand mining, uh, sand, uh, uh, you know, uh, pirates into, mm -hmm. into jail, and we are driving them out. And recently, you see the Padda uh, breeze, they are uh, mining sands very close to, very near to the piers. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, send our people and we asked the authorities to stop it. And then we investigated that area just with uh, Dr. Vargo was there with us on our way to Kustia. We investigated that area. So it is a challenging job, but we are not afraid to uh, you know, take on the task. We are doing it. Great. Uh, Dr. Edward recently a study uh, led by uh, your lab uh, discovered that a common ant uh, species uh, showed physiological and behavioral changes during urbanization. Uh, the research will shed light on how invasive species cope with changes in the environment. Uh, would you like to share more details on that research with our audience? Sure. Um, urbanization is a, a process uh, that's happening all around the world. Um, urban environments are important uh, environments in terms of the landmass they now occupy, and there's every indication that they're only going to get bigger as more and more people move into cities. So a big question is how will the organisms other than humans that live in these environments adapt um, and survive? And so there's a big field of study now looking at how organisms uh, adapt to urban environments. And so we've studied this one ant uh, that changes its social uh, organization between the natural habitats that are around the city and the urban habitats that are in, are in the city. So around the city, the, the ant colonies are very small. Ant colonies like honeybee colonies have a queen and workers. And these colonies in the natural areas have a single queen, but in the urban areas, they have many queens and they span a much larger area. And when we look at invasive species of ants around the world, the ones that are most important, um, fire. It, fire ants, but also Argentine ants and the yellow uh, crazy ant and, and other ants, they form what we call super colonies where they have many, many queens and they, form, they cover vast areas and ecologically dominate areas. And so there's always been a question of how this process occurs because in the native range, they have pretty small colonies that are pretty inconspicuous and, and not problematic. But then in the invasive range, they, they change their social organization. And so this species that we have in the US is a native species in the US, but it changes its social organization in a way that resembles the invasive species going from natural to urban environments. So we're, this is a very good system for us to try to understand this process of how these species uh, change in a way that makes them uh, uh, invasive and an ecological and economic problem. And uh, how, how do you think this year's COP27 uh, ended? What, what do you think uh, about the decided loss and damage fund? Uh, do you think that the developed countries are doing enough to combat this global issue? To, to, I, I didn't catch the first part of the question. Um, how, uh, how do you think this year's COP27 ended? Yes. Um, and uh, what do you think about the uh, decided loss and damage uh, fund? And uh, do you think the developed countries are doing enough to combat uh, this global issue? No. I, mean, climate I think issues? that definitely the developed countries are not doing enough. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think there's a lot of support. I, I can speak from the perspective of my country. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have some information about other developed countries in Europe and so on, but I know that in my country, especially young people, it's a very big issue, uh, climate change. And 
uh, we the, the government hasn't taken this seriously enough. And I think, I think that many people realize that the developing countries share the burden of the consequences of climate change. When we see increased storm activity, uh, flooding, sea level rises, those are going to disproportionately affect developing countries. And yet this is a problem that's largely caused by, um, the, the, by the developed countries. So I think there's a lot more we can do um, and I'm, I'm hoping that politicians uh, in the near future will take this more seriously. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary, we, we, you know, uh, there are many rivers in Bangladesh uh, that are, are dying uh, and uh, there are uh, so many issues that need to be dealt with. So would you like to uh, share your plan in the next uh, one year as uh, the chairman of the River uh, Conservation Commission of Bangladesh? Uh, we already started a program to clean the uh, rivers around Dhaka city and we have a plan to do this, uh, clean the sea, uh, rivers uh, before the next birthday of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Rahman, that is the 17th of March. And we are working on it, but the progress uh, is not that much. Progress is not that much. In Shabar area, we have some uh, success, but in other areas, like in Kranikons, in Rubkons, we are expecting that there will be some more renewed, uh, you know, uh, work, uh, uh, renewed work to uh, stop the pollution. And the problem is about the pollution is that the law, we have plenty of laws to prevent pollution, but the laws are not uh, applied uh, properly. That's one issue we have identified. Mm -hmm. Regarding the other, um, uh, other areas, we have some, we have plans. We have plans, first thing is that we respond to the, uh, if there is an immediate uh, occupation, encroachment or pollution problem, we respond immediately, depending on the severity of the uh, problem. But in otherwise, we are collecting data, we are um, uh, monitoring the situation, we are in the process of uh, procuring funds to um, uh, equip our uh, staffs, such as uh, um, uh, monitoring pollution, monitoring pollution, uh, mapping, and also we are going to um, acquire uh, survey equipment. That's important to prevent, uh, you know, encroachment because large patches of rivers, large stretches of rivers, and also the canals uh, within the city have been already occupied. We are planning to uh, survey those areas and uh, get their uh, collect the. Uh, the, uh, the plot numbers and declare those plot numbers as a public trust property and they should be transferred to the number one Khutian in mm. Bangladesh uh, Khutian so that nobody can sell those plots, nobody can transfer those plots. So we will devalue uh, the land they stole from the public, devalue mm -hmm. through the legal process. That's, that's what we are in the planning stage. And also, regarding another thing, that there is a sand mining, illegal sand mining. It, is, it has some, everybody thinks that um, sand mining is a criminal activity. It's not so. Sand mining is required. Sand mining will be done because without sand, we cannot continue our uh, tremendous development war going on all over the country. You have seen that uh, uh, in our way to Kustia and way back to Kush uh, Dhaka. So, uh, uh, we will. We are organizing a seminar on sand mining, how the sand mining can be done uh, with the, within the legal framework and how sand man, mining can be done uh, safely. And there are other sources of uh, quality sands. We will try to identify those and help the, uh, help the, uh, you know, the sand mining communities to mine the sand with, uh, uh, legally uh, and also economically and uh, uh, identifying the sources of good quality sands. Not all sands are useful for you know, construction work. That is one thing we are trying to do. And also, we are going to organize uh, seminars and uh, planning to uh, uh, empower the river police and also the industrial police mm -hmm. so that they can prevent uh, pollution uh, right away. Okay. 
Dr. Bhargav, what, what do you uh, think uh, the developing countries' role should uh, be in combating climate change? The developing countries, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think one, one, one thing that can be done is as countries are developing, and, and they are developing, <laughs> I see that here in, in Bangladesh, it's, it's developing at an incredible rate, that hopefully you can learn some things that some, from some of the uh, mistakes that we made in, our, in other developed countries when we developed. Uh, for example, um, uh, taking care of our rivers. Mm -hmm. In the Mississippi River, there are lots of problems that have emerged that we're only realizing now, and some people realized some time ago, but it's becoming very uh, well known and, and important. Um, and so as you're developing, I think taking some lessons from what other countries have done that could be improved and incorporating those from sort of the beginning instead of trying to retroactively uh, fix things. Um, but the, the burden of climate change, I think, right now rests on the shoulders of the developed countries because they are by far and away the major source of greenhouse gases and, and other issues that create, uh, that lead to climate change. Uh, Dr. Choudhury, we have seen uh, the severity of the uh, dengue fever countrywide recently, and the official death toll from the mosquito-borne diseases rose uh, to 244 this year. Uh, do you think we need to take a different approach uh, to deal with the whole scenario? In that case, do you have any suggestions? I made a lot of suggestions about uh, mm -hmm. uh, dengue uh, uh, prevention and mosquito management uh, uh, for, for, the, for during the last uh, two, three decades. But the problem is that the government is not uh, taking proper actions. They have a standard procedure for managing dengue, like uh, you know, initiating uh, monitoring the dengue cases early in the season, not in the middle of the season, not when they are in a peak condition early in the season. If you detect the cases during the March, April time when it is a lean season for dengue, you, what you do, you find out the location where the mosquitoes are, you know, uh, they have virus. They have virus in their bodies because there is a dengue patient. And first thing is that you kill the, uh, the virus bearing mosquitoes, that is Aedes uh, aegypti. And then by uh, applying, uh, you know, uh, fogging applications uh, or um, ULV application, and then uh, raising awareness such as uh, uh, cleaning uh, uh, the pots and pans, keeping the wa water, uh, you know, dry, containers dry, and other actions they can take. They can take. In that way, the virus will not be able to spread to other areas, to other areas. That way, you will be able to contain the uh, spread of virus, the number of uh, virus uh, patients uh, within the limited uh, scale. Uh, that's the approach India has taken. India has taken and they have solved uh, more or less their dengue, chikungunya, and they have also malaria problem uh, by just monitoring this. And also you monitor the serotype. You monitor, you, have a, you should have a different monitoring approach. What they are doing is, uh, pre-monsoon, monsoon, post-monsoon, post sampling. This is for malaria. Mm -hmm. This one not dengue. For dengue, you have to have a around the year uh, uh, sentinel sampling. There are techniques. It is available. It's not something that you have to do a lot of research work. It's, it's, it's there. But the point is, they are not willing to do that. Because uh, dengue, uh, you know, mosquito why? management, why? Why? mosquito... Why they are not willing to do that? Uh, <laughs> Mosquito management is a science. It's a science. It's established science. Here, it is not recognized as a uh, you know scientific discipline or whatever. The doctors, medical doctors, they try to control mosquito. Mm -hmm. If an entomologist, if a physicist, if a geographer wants to treat a patient, mm -hmm. the patient will die. Here, 
a doctor is trying to kill the mosquito. Mm -hmm. he, he has no training there. He has no training or experience in managing mosquitoes. For example, you see, you have to have a good monitoring uh, system. Now this year, mosquito, uh, you know, dengue spread 62 districts out of 64. So all over Bangladesh, dengue is there. It is mosquito is there. But we do not know exactly, but there are indications that in the rural areas, in the countryside, in the district level, the dengue is being spread by Aedes albopictus. It's not Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti is a purely container breeding mosquito. Albopictus is a natural uh, receptacles like uh, tree holes, uh, uh, tea, uh, leaf axils and other places like this. So the control approach should be different. And moreover, you have a specific pesticide for controlling these vector uh, these vectors. Those are not available here. But, or to, there is no encouragement on the part mm. of the government to register those products, make them available at uh, you know at the shops so that public, uh, the general public can buy them and apply them themselves. It is it should be done. Otherwise, uh, the problem will remain there. And in India, in Calcutta, what happened when they uh, given the responsibility of uh, vector control to the entomologist, they immediately start uh, the immediately that problem uh, subsided. But this is uh, not the case here in Bangladesh, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bhago, as an entomologist, uh, you study insects uh, uh, and you use science to identify, classify, and study insects and, and their relationships uh, to plants and animal life. Uh, so, what is your best achievement and uh, what challenges do you find in your work? Uh, my best achievements? Um, I would say working on termites and understanding <coughs> the breeding system of termites. So, termites like ants and bees have uh, a queen and a king that reproduce and they often have multiple kings or queens. Mm -hmm. And with my colleague uh, in Japan, Kenji Matsura, we discovered that in one species of termite, the queens can be re replaced uh, by the mother queen that starts the colony through asexual reproduction. So that she can be replaced, she can produce new daughter queens without any fertilization of the eggs. And this was new to termites, we hadn't known this, and once we discovered it, it's been found to be very common uh, in other species. So it's a brand new reproductive system mm -hmm. that we didn't know about in termites. But I think that is part of a general um, area that I've contributed to in terms of the, the breeding system of, of termites. And and the second uh, part of the question? The second part of the question is that what challenges do you find in your work? The biggest challenges we have is often collecting material. The termites that we study live under the underground. You can't see the nests, and so um, just finding the, the colonies can, can be difficult. Um, and then thinking of questions uh, about the reproductive system and then finding the right species to study them. And the other thing is that most termites live in tropical areas, mm -hmm. and I live in a, a temperate area, so we have to travel to the tropics to do the work on the tropical species. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary, would you like to share uh, the overview of your uh, take on the Delta Plan of Bangladesh? Uh, Delta Plan is a very ambitious plan. Uh, it is about uh, our river system. It's, a, it's going to be a 100-year uh, plan. It's going to be a 100-year project. And the beauty of this, or challenge of this project, is that those who are working right now, they will not be, uh, uh, and they will not leave when the project ends. So one generation is handing over, restoring the rivers, and then handing over to the next generation, maybe a generation uh, later. So it is very ambitious, but it is also very, uh, you know, uh, very useful in the sense that our country is mostly river. You see, you have seen a lot of rivers, and uh, long rivers, wide rivers, small rivers, uh, streams, all sorts of rivers. And Delta Plan will streamline many of these uh, river system into, uh, into something, uh, 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 so for example, the 
or planning to uh, create two river corridors. River corridors will be something like uh, a, 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 a river where there will be a lot of industries on the on both sides of the river because uh, some of the rivers are 18 kilometers wide. So there will be a lot of land reclaimed and there will be new industrial areas and other um, activities may be uh, initiated in those areas. That's the good side. That's the optimistic side. The, uh, the risk is that if you, uh, uh, you know, establish a lot of industries along the rivers, then there is a chance that the river system will be totally contaminated and that will be a tremendous, uh, that will be dangerous uh, situation for Bangladesh because our rivers provide a lot of fishes, you know, uh, Hilsha fish we get from the Meghna estuary uh, provide uh, supplies about 12% uh, of uh, animal protein for, this, uh, uh, for the people of this country. And there are other uh, species of fish. If we contaminate our river system, then we will not be able to uh, you know, supply, ensure a nutrition, proper nutrition for the vast majority of the people. So, challenge is to uh, develop, you know, challenge is to uh, industrialize at the same time, make sure that environment is not uh, contaminated or degraded. Some of our rivers are already degraded. I am trying to, as a chairman of the National River Conservation Commission, that uh, uh, impress upon the industrialists that you can manufacture all the products you want, but you can do in an environmentally uh, responsible way. That's possible. We have a more than 100 green factories in this country. It is possible. So I'm going to work with them also closely, very closely. So Delta Plan is it's a bigger plan, it's a very ambitious plan, but already government has started. I think that it is one of the uh, milestones of this government that they have initiated this. But still, there are a lot of things should be done because river is a powerful element, natural element. You cannot tame them as the way you want. You, you can simply manage them. You cannot uh, uh, do a lot of things with rivers. rivers uh, in this country uh, has, you know, it's a, it's a very strong, powerful natural force. We know what happens when there is a flooding in Bangladesh. In many parts of Bangladesh, we get a lot of floods and that floods is devastating. So managing these rivers, creating corridors will be done with the best uh, scientific knowledge. That's why I have already uh, to work with uh, the river, uh, you know, pollution problem, uh, I have already contacted uh, uh, the University of Georgia, Autumn, uh, Eco uh, Autumn School of Ecology. You, you know, Dr. Autumn, uh, Autumn. Autumn was the pioneer in ecological uh, system, and he was a professor at the uh, Institute of Ecology at the University of Georgia. I was also there when Aid was at the University of Georgia. We knew uh, Gene Autumn. And we have contacted uh, his, his no more, his institute, and we are in contact with them. We may uh, bring a team, we are working to bring a team of, uh, you know, river scientists, those who know actually what to do, how to restore the rivers. Restoration of rivers is different uh, than uh, just working with the engineering things. They are very much experienced. They have a river basin center, and also they have uh, the Savannah River uh, Research Center. So they, they have a lot of experience with the river system, river management. We are going to bring a team here so that uh, they can help us with, the, uh, with our river problem. Dr. Edward, the summit 2022 illustrated just how sensitive some key waterways uh, are to droughts. Uh, the Mississippi, uh, Yangtze, and Rhine rivers that all experience serious bottlenecks. Uh, uh, droughts are uh, creating uh, new supply chain problems. Uh, we know the importance of rivers uh, to maintain ecological balance. Uh, what's your comment on this? Well, um, of course, rivers are important in maintaining ecological balance. Um, rivers provide uh, 
obviously fresh water for us and water for irrigation. They provide a source of biodiversity. They create special habitats. They create, uh, they're usually um, wetlands associated with rivers that help absorb uh, water when there's flooding. And in the case of the Mississippi, uh, which is one I'm most familiar with, the Mississippi is a very highly engineered river. Even. So Manjur said that we can't control rivers, but in the U.S. we've tried. <laughs> <laughs> So we have uh, a highly engineered river with, with levees, dams, to control the water so that we can use the land right up to the water and done away with a lot of the wetlands associated with the water. And so that creates problems when there's high rainfall um, that we don't have the mechanisms to absorb the water like we normally do. So the water will eventually rise above the levees and when it does flood, it's a very serious problem. Whereas the, the natural wetlands make that problem much, much less of a problem. And um, uh, um, please continue. Well, and then the, the, one of the main problems with the Mississippi is that we've changed the deposit of the sediments hmm. in the delta. So the, the amount of sediments going to the delta has decreased by 70% since mm -hmm. the 1800s. And that's because of deep channels that have been cut into the river to make it more navigable and more friendly towards, towards shipping. But it's cut off a lot of the fingers that feed the delta. So we have a lot of wetlands, a lot of islands that develop through the sediment. Mm -hmm. And those islands get washed away as storms come, so they erode. And in the Mississippi Delta, there's, there's a tremendous erosion taking place. We have, we lose the size of one football field mm -hmm. every hour mm. in the Mississippi Delta. So we've lost uh, something like 5,000 square miles in the last 30 years or so. And that's because of, they've redirected the flow of the water and the flow of sediments, um, which are not replenishing uh, the, the Delta area. So it's a, it, it, it's a huge problem, um, and many people are thinking about how this can be changed, but it's, it's a difficult problem because we have the shipping mm -hmm. and everything in place. Um, so, but, but after we had Hurricane Katrina in 2007, that caused very serious flooding in New Orleans, so, and this was one of the consequences of changing uh, the flow of the river. And so people have been thinking about maybe how we can make some modifications to help redirect some of the sediments. So I, I hope that you know, these kinds of practices uh, are actually put into place and we can start to restore some of that habitat. I can uh, okay. add a little bit sure. of that sure. Mississippi mm -hmm. uh, problem. Mississippi, uh, we, we think that uh, most of the grains, most of the food materials in the, in the US, especially the Midwest, are transported by train or trucks. It's not the case. Most of them are transported by barges through the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. The Mississippi dried up as a result, uh, you know, uh, the cost of uh, transporting by truck, trains have increased. So some of the, some of the growers, they are storing their, uh, you know, grains mm -hmm. when waiting that when Mississippi will flood again and then they will, uh, you know, transport it at an economical uh, rate, at an economical rate. That's the, the importance of river, that's the importance, even in a highly, you know, uh, uh, mechanized uh, society, mm -hmm. the uh, USA, where there are hundreds of thousands of miles of high quality road, train lines, still, uh, river uh, was the main, uh, main uh, route for transporting grains economically. So we have to think about our rivers too, because uh, the river is the best way to transport goods, especially in in our in a situation like this, but unfortunately, our river system are getting more and more uh, you know degraded. That some sections of the rivers are occupied or silted uh, out. All sorts of things are happening, mm -hmm. and one of the causes is that one of the probably the major causes is that the water from upstream, that is uh, transboundary rivers, are uh, is erratic. During the dry season, we get very little water, and when during the wet season, we get uh, rainy season, we get too much of water. 
when there is uh, too much rain in the uh, you know uh, northern state in northern uh, India in Meghalaya in Assam uh, then what they do they uh, they open up uh, their uh, uh, dams there is uh, rainwater heavy rainwater at the same time uh, uh, the water from the dam suddenly released they inundate our uh, 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 our plain land here that's one of the major problems so we have to have a, a good negotiation with our neighbors to ensure the sustained flow of river because we have a right we have a right to and, uh, and, and you, you know you, uh, we have issues with India uh, our neighbor in Cardi regarding the Tista water sharing uh, uh, due to the conservative policy of the West Bengal and Sikkim uh, government we didn't get the previ previous deal uh, how do you think this might affect Bangladesh in the long run uh, I I think that uh, it is unlikely that India will ever uh, give us uh, water from Tista because at the Gozaldaba point and the, the Bras, they diverted uh, all the water to the Mohananda. Mm -hmm. And along that Mohananda you know, channels, along the channels, they have developed a very highly lucrative agricultural and horticultural system. Whatever water we get is uh, beyond, uh, beyond the uh, Gozaldaba point, the rains and the, some tributaries uh, uh, feeding that system. We will not get water from. We have to conserve water uh, in, inside Bangladesh to okay. supply during the dry season. Mm -hmm. But the problem with the Chinese program that the Chinese uh, government offered to uh, build a barrage uh, or system, a river management system, reclaim land and a set of industries, there will be more Chinese workers working there. India. Uh, from security point of view, India may not want uh, so many Chinese uh, workers so close to their Doklam border, uh, that Siliguri uh, uh, corridor. So I think my, if as a citizen, not as a chairman or, or a government official, uh, my suggestion would be to build this, uh, you know, uh, water system with our own money, but get this, uh, you know, we increase the mm -hmm. uh, transit charge and get it from the uh, transit fee. You increase the transit fee uh, considerably, mm -hmm. recover the, uh, you know, this cost, because this is due to India. They, they, whatever we are suffering uh, uh, along the Tista uh, Basin, Tista River, uh, it is due to India. It is their political decision. It is their decision. That, is, uh, that, that decision has no, uh, you know, that's not a legal decision, that's not a right decision, they are, what they are doing. So, we will build our uh, barrage or whatever uh, uh, water holding system we have to do, we'll do that with our own money and charge India through enhanced transit fee. And that will, that will save them from a uh, you know, security problem in near uh, Siliguri corridor. Dr. Ed, uh, as I was talking uh, with um, Dr. Chaudhary uh, earlier, uh, and I think uh, you are aware of that, uh, uh, of the uh, severity of the dengue uh, all over Bangladesh and uh, in many other countries. Uh, as an entomologist, uh, what would be your suggestion to deal with uh, dengue more effectively? So, uh, there are a number of programs in place uh, in other countries um, to use pesticides to um, but they as put, Dr. Uh, in, in USA dengue is not is not a problem at all it's, they have we, eliminated although we have both uh, Aedes albopictus and yes. Aedes aegypti mm -hmm. um, so it's always a concern that it could they, it, it, it could spring it's up um, so there there are programs in place but as you said that you know, the different species have different breeding uh, habitats. So it's, in it's one case... They have, uh, they, they, they have a lot of tires, you know, abundant tires. So for Egypti, if you can get rid of the, the water in the tires or containers around the houses, that can be an effective problem. So a lot of people are working on genetic engineering as a method for controlling uh, 80s and also Anopheles, which transmit malaria. Um, so this is a big area that I know a number of people 
um, in the U.S. and uh, around the world are working on, and we have people in my department actually working on that to genetically engineer the mosquitoes to either eliminate the populations mm -hmm. or to make them um, less um, competent to transmit the, the dengue virus. Uh. Both of your uh, classmates at the University of Georgia, uh, so uh, how did you to meet and uh, did you work together at the University of Georgia, uh, uh, Dr. Chaudhary? Uh, uh, he was in a different uh, program, that is, he was a social insect. I was purely an agricultural entomology program, uh, protecting uh, corns uh, from uh, the insects. Uh, so it was a pest management program. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were very good, uh, we were close friends when, while we were at the University of Georgia in Athens, the great city of Athens. And, uh, but we met up with uh, many times when we went to conferences, inter entomological society uh, meetings, uh, we met. Uh, and, uh, but this, was the, this is a great opportunity that Ed uh, found time to visit Bangladesh and I was able to take him to some places, show the our great mighty rivers, Padda, uh, and uh, I hope because he is basically an uh, ecologist. Uh, because we all are ecologists. Uh, mm -hmm. The University of Georgia biology students are by training they are ecologists. Uh, do we all we all read studied the fundamentals of ecology mm -hmm. uh, uh, in our courses? So uh, it is a great opportunity to show it. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to. Uh, we have, uh, I showed him the good rivers, the mighty rivers, mm -hmm. beautiful rivers, mm -hmm. Arielka River, my home <laughs> town river. Now, tomorrow, uh, we are going to show him some bad rivers, mm -hmm. that uh, rivers which are polluted, which are dying, and uh, uh, which has uh, degraded uh, tremendously. So, he will, when he goes back to uh, USA, uh, he, he will do some work for us to how we can solve this uh, problem, how we can save our uh, rivers. Mm -hmm. Dr. Edward? Yeah, so as Manjir said, we, we're in different laboratories. So the mm. way we're organized in the department is you have different professors that run laboratories and they have different areas of research. And so ours, ours were different, but uh, we were, we're in the same department and we developed a friendship. Um, and it's tremendous to see how successful he's been. <laughs> And not just uh, as a scientist, but um, you know, as a as a voice, as, as a leader. <laughs> yeah, as a voice, as a as a leader, as an administrator uh, in an area that's a little bit beyond uh, what he was trained in. But I think that speaks to the strength of our training we received at the University of Georgia. Georgia. Another of our classmates. Um, Hashul Bakar is running for... He, he's a senator in, in Nigeria. So oh, he, yeah. Hashul yeah. Ari is a senator. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a different classmate. <laughs> no, no, <different laughs> Hashul Bakar, uh, he was a uh, you know, uh, running back at the football uh, in 1980s. Uh, he's now running for the Senate in mm -hmm. Georgia. As you say, yeah. But as I was saying, uh, so we have... Uh, Ashola uh, Adia in Nigeria. In Nigeria, who's a senator, uh, and we have Manjur, who's uh, chairman of the National uh, River Conservation Commission, which is a very high-level position. Uh, and then there were other students that gone that went on to be successful scientists. Um, so it's it's really nice to have that relationship over this 40-year period and see people's careers um, really take off. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Munjir Ahmed Chaudhary and Dr. Eduardo Vago uh, for the most insightful uh, perspectives uh, you have uh, provided for our audience uh, today. Thank you so much. Uh, dear guests, uh, the rivers and the biodiversity of Bangladesh uh, is uh, precious uh, and definitely worth protecting. Uh, hopefully our conversations today was uh, fruitful uh, in this regard and we hope to carry on this conversation for a long time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.